production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High. Meet Gehanna-based textile artist Wendy Kendrick, who uses collage techniques to create bold and beautiful art quilts. Never let anyone tell you what you can or cannot be. Artist Julie Green has spent the last 20 years illustrating the final meals of death row inmates. And music by Columbus duo Starlet Ways. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Our first story today takes us out to Gehanna and the home studio of Wendy Kendrick. That's where she makes use of collage techniques to create bold and beautiful art quilts that feature African-inspired masks. Here's her story. Well, let's see, how far back do you want me to go? I was the kid that always loved art. I knew that I wanted to be an artist, but coming up during the time when I came up, um, when I went to college, it was the early 70s. Um, and for my parents, they, it just wasn't in their realm of thinking. My first point of rebellion was when I went to college. So I ended up going to school at Dartmouth. And so I was an art major, but I did not understand what art was like in college. And there were a lot of basics I didn't have. Our art department in high school was very small. So I hadn't had any formal training uh, to prepare me. Um, and then my junior year, I had a printmaking class and there was a visiting uh, professor from Japan. And this, professor comes over to me at one day in, during class and she just starts going off. She looks at my work and she just starts berating me in front of the whole class. You know, she's questioning why I'm in the program, who told me I was an artist. I mean, to this day I could still hear it and it was the most humiliating thing I had ever experienced up until that point. It just had turned my world upside down and it just crushed me. I made it through, okay, but it was very hard. I didn't know how to process that at all, but it was a, a serious wound that when I left school, when I graduated, I said to myself, I'll never do it again. I will never do this art thing again. After I graduated, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything with my art at all. But it was just, it was just gnawing at me. It gnawed at me for all those years. It probably was about the time that I met my husband, I think. And so we were dating and the very first gift that I ever gave him was a piece that I did. It was from an ad I saw in a magazine and I just did it in pastel, did it on paper, uh, had it matted and framed and he asked me where I got it from so I told him I said I did it and he just like no you didn't and I said yeah I did this he said I didn't even know you did art okay because I didn't didn't talk about it at all some years had passed a few years had passed and I saw a um, little notice in the dispatch for the Columbus Museum of Art docent program I did get into the program, so I entered in that class of 2000. We had teams at the museum, and so on our team, which was a Thursday team, we had quite a few artists. And they just encouraged me to take advantage of, you know, classes, which we were able to do through CCAD, um, and just to work at the art. Once I got started, I started with paper and collage because I always had enjoyed the work and loved the work of Romare Bearden. 
but somewhere along as it continued, um, start putting a little fabric in there. And over time, I was adding more and more and more. And so it just hit me, why don't you pull that sewing machine out? And I started with this strip quilting. That was the very first thing I did. And at one point, I did set a goal that I wanted to try and begin to make these pieces um, dimension, have some dimension to them, not just be flat. Um, and then from there, it was like, I, I didn't look back because it opened a door for me. It was the connection to things I had learned as a kid from my grandmother sewing. My grandmother had taught me how to sew. It was a connection to what I knew and it just felt good. So I've kind of zigzagged in terms of the art journey. Um, I'm in a place that I'm very comfortable in terms of who I am, dealing with the wound from the past, which I'm thankful for. I just see it as being part of my tapestry. Never let anyone tell you what you can or cannot be. Even though I said I would never do it again, it's who I am. Learn more about Wendy Kendrick at artbywepa.net or give her a follow on Instagram. And here's a story of another, but decidedly different, Columbus quilter. Rather than using fabric, Chris Mercerhill sews together actual photographs. His geometric technique and use of the Ohio Star quilting pattern results in a kaleidoscope type of artwork that compels the viewer to step a little closer to identify the pattern, the stitches, and even some iconic landmarks of our capital city. I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. I came to the United States to go to graduate school. Met my wife there in South Carolina. We moved to Illinois and then back to Ohio because it's closer to home. So kind of a classic story, really. I've always been interested in patterns, you know, shapes, uh, squares, triangles. So when I set out to make a photo quilt, a quilt made of photos sewn together, I, I start with an image. So this, this is an image of um, the North Market. So I'm gonna use this photo and I'm gonna make its mirror image. For the bottom half of the quilt, I'll cut these two inches off. And then the next layer, I'll cut uh, one, and a, one and three quarters and a little bit off of here. And then I march it down like this. So by the end, by the top row, I'm using these, this, this is my four inch square. So the effect this creates is from the top to the bottom, the, the, the source image shifts slightly and changes. And these lines, which are at you know, odd angles, um, really lend this dynamism. They, they intersect in really uh, interesting ways that create diamond shapes and, and points and, and spikes. Traditional quilts they're made with fabric and so often you know the story is uh, this is my grandma's apron and this is my aunt Myrtle's dress that she wore to Sunday school and for me I can capture memories through photographs I can I can identify patterns or places or things and then use them in much the same way make a quilt out of those instead of out of fabric and so it's all about you know exploring the city finding interesting viewpoints, finding things that, that reach out to me as a, as a really dynamic image, and then I cut them up and sew them together and see what happens. When I was in Illinois, I started working on a pattern called Log Cabin, which is sort of a square with these strips all the way around that just repeat and repeat and repeat, which kind of gives the effect of a log cabin. And I was in the land of Lincoln, when I came to Ohio a little over 10 years ago, um, you know, I was thinking and exploring, and I found this Ohio Star pattern. And so the, the Ohio Star pattern, it's called a nine patch quilt. There's a group of patterns called that because they're three squares by three squares. 
And so this one, uh, four of the squares have triangles that sort of form an X. And so the thing I like about these is you get these, where these four triangles come together, you get these sort of kaleidoscopic -y, diamond -y spots. And then there's this pattern that sort of repeats uh, square, triangle, square. But when you put it next to another block, it's square, triangle, square. So right when you think you've discovered the pattern, square, triangle, square, that's not a triangle, that's another square. And it, it's, it, to my eye, it's complicated enough that you have to sort of look twice to really figure it out. And I don't always feel like when I'm looking at it that I've figured it out. One thing I really try to do with my work is, is to create objects that you can appreciate both up close and from a distance. So from a distance, it almost looks like a carpet or wallpaper or interesting shapes. And then you get up close and you go, hey, there's a person there. They're walking down an aisle. Is that the North Market? And you kind of look and go, that's the North Market. I love fabric quilts. I make fabric quilts. Uh, my wife and I make fabric quilts together. But for me, there's something about photographs and sewing them together. And I guess maybe it's the, um, the resolution, the clarity you can get with a photograph that um, really sets it apart from fabric. I think my work is sort of about noticing the beauty around us and uh, you know, sort of stopping and pausing and appreciating it in, in, in a way maybe we haven't before. Check out more of Chris's work on his website at chrismercerhill.com and he's on Instagram too. Our local music series continues with a performance by the Columbus duo known as Starlit Ways. The two began playing together after meeting at church six years ago. And so it seems fitting that the song they're sharing with us today was influenced by a verse in the book of Proverbs about the power of positive thinking. Here they are performing C'est Toi. C'est toi C'est toi Si tu penses Que tu n'es capable de rien mmh, Ou si tu penses Que tu en es bien capable D'une façon ou d'une autre, tu as raison. C'est toi, c'est vrai. Si je pense que tu en es bien capable, ah, dis-moi quelle différence cela fera. Si toi-même tu n'y crois pas, oh, c'est toi, c'est vrai. Ne les écoute pas, ne les écoute pas, ne les écoute pas, ne les écoute pas. Des mensonges, ils te trahiront après que tu les aies suivis. Non, ne les suis pas. Ne les écoute pas, 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 ne les écoute pas,
Fiancé, entourage, mauvaise influence Mais il faut que tu y crois en toi Car si tu n'y crois pas, oh, dis-moi qui d'autre Dis-moi qui d'autre la fera pour toi Ne les écoute pas Tu sois bien plus que tu n'imagines. Crois en toi. Keep up with the band at StarletWays.com or by giving them a follow on Facebook. And watch more from their recent visit to WOSU at WOSU.org slash local tunes. 3 double cheeseburgers, 3 orders of fries, a whole strawberry cheesecake with whipped cream, a vanilla milkshake, and grapefruit juice. That was the final meal requested by the last person executed by the state of Ohio. Artist Julie Green has spent the last 20 years documenting these final meals of death row inmates and assembling them into a compelling collection she calls The Last Supper. to make something that brought the viewer in, that had a degree of beauty, so that they would look at the plates and then go, oh, that's what they're about. Each of these plates represents the final meal of a prisoner on death row. Julie Green was teaching art in Oklahoma when the idea came to her while reading the paper over breakfast. In Oklahoma at that time, there were many executions, highest per capita in the United States, still is, and so I just started saving these clippings. They bothered me. Oklahoma, 8 July, 1999. Six tacos, six glazed donuts, and a cherry Coke. Texas, 22 October, 2001. A bag of Jolly Ranchers. The project, as you can tell, has many different shapes of plates. They're all basically white or off-white. Most are porcelain, some are stoneware. Um, different sizes, they're almost all secondhand. When Martha Stewart was in prison, I did go to Kmart and buy uh, a Martha Stewart plate um, that I happened to notice. I wanted them all to be basically white, look uniform, look like a system, but not a matte set because they represent individuals. This is a Florida plate and for lobster, shrimp, baked potato, cheesecake, uh, and a drink. And the information came back. Um, he enjoyed his last meal, ate every bite. This is a North Carolina plate, one honey bun. When you walk into the gallery, it's this beautiful display of plates. It's almost homey. And uh, then the content is just a, a big flip. This is an Indiana plate and the words mother on the front from 2001. German ravioli and chicken dumplings prepared by his mother and prison dietary staff. So his mother actually received clearance to come into the prison kitchen and cook that meal. Julie's work draws from an approach to art in Mexico called retableau. Retableau in Mexican painting is like remi remembrance of something that will otherwise go unnoticed. These are um, Mississippi menus, 23 July, 1947, same. 
fried chicken, watermelon. He was only 16, he was only 15. There were two boys quickly convicted of murder. And executed by a traveling electric chair the next day. A traveling electric chair. I ordered those special from the China painting catalog because they were appropriate for those two meals. Because they were so young? Yeah, because they were so young. They're very small plates. They're, they're palm of the hand size. This is an Indiana plate, and the information from the Department of Corrections came back. He never had a birthday cake, so we ordered a birthday cake for him. It's very important. It is important uh, in the sense that it fulfills one of art's roles. There are many, but it makes us stand still and think. Think about something we don't really want to think about. Texas represents a third of all the plates, about a third of all the plates in the show. And these five Texas plates, um, consecutive in fall of 2007, had no final meal request had no final meal request, had no final meal request. This tells me that the inmates are aware of what other inmates are eating or not eating. The variety of the plates also reflect the different ways the states implement the death penalty. Oklahoma dropped its final meal allowance from $20 to 15. This plate represents the last final meal request granted in Texas. When the prisoner returned his meal untouched, the state stopped the practice. In many states are limited to what's on hand in the prison pantry. So you can really tell, like in Oklahoma, you get restaurant meals, same with California. And so those are more varied. This is an Oregon plate. Um, the request is five eggs sunny side up. Um, it's a breakfast meal, pancakes. And the request closed with, I would appreciate the eggs hot. One plate centers around pecan pie. An Arkansas inmate with brain damage ate half before his execution, thinking he could eat the other half after the execution was over. He didn't understand. He didn't understand. Yeah. There is misery in this whole process from the crime that was committed. Somebody was generally murdered. So there was victims, victim's family, so many levels of suffering. Part of my motivation for the project is that it generates conversation on our system of capital punishment. And, and it has done that to a far greater degree than I would have ever expected. The Last Supper depicts the most humane moment in a long chain of misery that starts and ends with death. By focusing on the mundane, limited choices of food, by putting them on grandma's china, and by staying true to the individual details of each meal, Julie Green hopes her art will cause more and more people to notice. It's one of the many reasons why she's still painting plates. I paint 50 a year. That's my plan to keep doing that um, until we don't have capital punishment anymore. Everybody has an opinion about capital punishment, actually, it seems like. And even my mom. It's changed my mom. So I figure, you know, right, I can't, I can't go about like trying to change people on capital punishment. But if it happens, um, that's fabulous. To date, Julie Green has painted more than 800 plates of last meals. And she has embarked on a new project where she illustrates the first meals exonerated prisoners have had upon their release. You can follow her on Instagram at Julie Green Art. And that's it for this week. You can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our free WOSU mobile app. And be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing out the show today with Won't more music by Columbus's very back. own Starlit Ways. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you back here next week. Don't you doubt it's you I think about. There is a
Tracy Peters, film and visual art. I'm a science, math, theoretical physics fiend. My art is bold, colorful, and geometric. It's science fiction. I love building characters and their worlds. I love the process of putting a story together visually, getting a polished film from raw materials. I'm inspired by the very diverse, very unpredictable Midwestern sensibility that lives in the arts community here. Ohio artists are notorious for being insanely innovative and they go for it in every conceivable way. I'm Celia C. Peters, film is my art, and there's no place I'd rather make it. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you.